While insects don't generally get a lot of love, the truth is that the planet's ecosystem depends on every creepy crawly out there. But researchers have been raising the alarms for some time now that all is not right in the bug world. Here to help us understand what's going on, let's welcome, in Brooklyn, New York, Oliver Millman, author of The Insect Crisis, The Fall of the Tiny Empires That Run the World. He's also an environment reporter for The Guardian U.S. In our nation's capital, Heather Karuba, associate professor in the Department of Biology at the University of Ottawa. And here in our studio, Antonia Guidotti, entomologist at the Royal Ontario Museum. And Antonia, it's great to have you here in our studio and to our guests in Points Beyond. Thank you for joining us as well. Okay, entomologist, what's that? Let's start there. Oh, that's a good question. It's uh, someone who studies insects, simply put. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. We also do arachnids, which means the spiders, scorpions, things like that. So you're the perfect guest to have here. Hmm. Oliver, as an environment reporter, I suspect you've been asked this before, but I gotta, I gotta pile on with this question. When was the moment you realized that bugs were your life and you needed to write a book about them? <laughs> uh, that is a great question, Steve. I mean, I think um, if somebody told me a few years ago my first book would be on insects, I probably wouldn't have believed them uh, as an environment reporter. You're kind of drawn to the big kind of flashy things of this world, uh, you know, polar bears, the Amazon rainforest, uh, the Great Barrier Reef, kind of things like this. Um, uh, but it was from speaking to scientists and looking at various kind of pieces of research coming out, it seemed from about 2017, 2018 onwards, we just had this kind of avalanche of research coming out showing these kind of huge population declines in uh, in insects in, in, in several parts of the world. And it became clear to me that this was a kind of a big untold silent crisis that was unfolding that we didn't really know uh, the full details of as yet, but uh, was something that I wanted to um, explore further. So I got to to walk around in entomologist's shoes for a couple of years and find out what was going on. And that is what we will explore over the next uh, nearly half hour here. Antonia, let's bring it home. What kinds of insects do we normally see here in the province of Ontario? Oh, there are thousands of different species of mm -hmm. insects in Ontario. Because um, I got to tell you, I don't see a lot of many more, you know? Well, you have to look in the right places. <laughs> okay. <laughs> go for a walk, go to the park, even in your backyard, sometimes in your house. Uh, insects are everywhere. There may not be as many of them, because I think um, Oliver's correct, the insect declines are real, they're happening, but there are insects everywhere that you go. You just have to keep your eyes open and uh, be curious. So Heather, that's not our imagination, because uh, you know I've heard lots of people say, the bugs splashing on my windshield when I drive up north doesn't happen anymore, my grill on the car is not covered with them anymore. They really are disappearing? Yeah, there's more and more reports from different areas of the world, um, both in not, like protected areas where we wouldn't necessarily expect to see declines, but also in areas where we would, like, you know, where humans live as well. But yeah, more and more there's um, substantial declines happening in different parts and different for different kinds of insects as well. And one in particular are you researching right now? So yeah, we're really interested in the monarch butterfly um, and looking at... Um, figuring out some aspects of why it's declining around Ottawa and then also how climate change is going to affect it. Okay, Oliver, have you noticed this as well? I have, yeah. I, I've, since, especially since I started writing the book, I've kind of tried to notice insects around me a bit more because I think we don't really think of insects that often. When we do, we often think of them as being irritating or, or we want them away from us. Um, but I've kind of started to think more about um, what I used to see and what I see now and, uh, you know, driving around for a week in uh, Montana, for example, a very sparsely populated state in the US, um, should be full of bugs. Uh, I ended the week, there was nothing on the windshield of, of the car, which is quite incredible when you think about it like that. Um, yeah, I noticed, uh, you know, I used to love kind of rolling over logs as a kid and looking at ants and things uh, under there. And um, yeah, I kind of worry that my, my kids aren't going to experience that to the same degree. There will always be insects, of course. There will be always more insects than us uh, around. But um, certainly there are changes um, that I think um, everyday people can can recognize. Well, Antonio, we've got to figure out why this is a problem, because I suspect if you ask people, you can go up to the cottage and no mosquitoes or no houseflies are going to bother you the whole time you're there. People might sign up for that deal right away. Now explain to us why that's a problem. Well, because those insects are really important parts of the food chain. Um, 
I think if you went up to the cottage and there were no birds, you'd be alarmed. Right. Um, oh, we like birds. We like we birds. We like the sound they make. We, we do. We like that they fly by and give us pleasure. But a lot of birds depend on insects, especially when they're baby chicks, for sustenance. They need insects to survive. So if there aren't insects for them to feed on, then they're going to starve. We want birds. And on the other side, even in the water, fish feed on a lot of insect larvae. There are a lot of insects that start out in the water, like those mosquitoes, like dragonflies. And if fish don't have food to eat, then they're not going to survive either. So we want fish. We want birds. There's so many small mammals, even reptiles and amphibians, that feed on insects. They're a very important part of our ecosystem. and. You may not like them at the cottage, but um, we got to have them. Of, Yeah. Okay, uh, Oliver, I want to do a quote from your book here about this because one of the things that you point to as affecting the size of the insect population these days is climate change. So, Sheldon, if you would, let's bring up this graphic with the quote from Oliver's book: "Climate change's cruel dexterity," you write, means that over decades it can liquefy the glacier homes of stoneflies, over years strip plants of nutrients needed by grasshoppers or over just an hour or two, barbecue a species of rare bee. For all the other damage we are currently inflicting on insects, at some point the insect crisis might be more easily seen as one of the many limbs of the climate crisis. It's interesting you put it that way, because uh, you know climate change is something that everybody's aware of now, and we know the kind of damage that it can do, broadly speaking. And I'm not sure anybody's ever, or not too many people outside of your line of work, think about what it does to the insect population. Do we need to do that now? We do. I think there was an assumption that insects would somehow be um, slightly removed from the effects of the climate crisis. I mean, there are so many of them. They're quite adaptable, after all. Um, uh, but there is more and more research coming out showing that insects are affected by climate change. They live in fairly narrow bands of temperature. If you think about bumblebees, for example, they're kind of permanently sewn into their, their winter coats, aren't they? Um, they? They can't deal with a, a temperature that's kind of vastly uh, increased from what, what it is now. And we're seeing that effect in uh, Canada and the US, that species of bumblebee are declining uh, and that those that are affected by climate change and um, uh, warmer temperatures are, are doing worse than than any other. So um, is that effect? I think it's important to point out that there are always going to be winners and losers. And unfortunately, the kinds of insects that will do quite well in a kind of warmer, damper world um, are mosquitoes. Uh, I mean, the range of mosquitoes carrying diseases is expected to expand globally due to climate change. So unfortunately, we are um, creating a world less hospitable for the insects we tend to, to love. Um, uh, um, monarch butterflies were mentioned earlier that they're, they're one that's suffering because of climate change we tend to really adore them uh, bumblebees uh, we really like them they're not doing very well because of climate change but uh, mosquitoes will do okay in, in many respects um, and that's not really a, a kind of trade-off I think many of us would like to see and Tony you agree with that we're gonna get more of the, more of the kind of bugs we don't want and fewer of the ones we truly need well, I mean, that's sort of happening in Ontario already. There are species of mosquito that can carry diseases that are moving in to southern Ontario. There are records of those already. Like what? So um, there are Aedes species. Um, that's the genus. Um, and they can carry things like Zika or chikungunya or other diseases that we may not be familiar with normally as part of Ontario. And they could easily, uh, they are coming in. So These are not good things. No. Got it. Heather, you told us earlier that monarch butterflies are your specialty, so tell us what climate change is doing to them. Well, um, it's quite complicated for the, for the monarch butterfly because of its complex life cycle. And so we're trying to figure out um, where and how climate change is affecting it. So it's basically getting you know, influenced by climate change throughout its range from you know, in Canada and all the way to Mexico. And so you know, it's been affected by summer temperatures in the U.S. and its breeding range, but then it's also affected by warmer winter temperatures in Mexico. Um, we think it's probably affecting its milkweed, its host plant. And so we're trying to figure out all of these different pathways that climate change is going to affect the monarch butterfly and figure out, you know, what is the most important driver there and what do we need to focus on? What about land use? What's climate change doing to land use? 
Well, I mean, climate change has a lot of different interacting factors with land use change. Um, a lot of things like forest fires, um, you know, the way that forests are rebounding or regenerating. And so there's a lot of different interacting factors. That's probably the one of the most complex um, aspects of this that we really don't have a good handle on is how climate change is interacting with other factors like land use change. Yeah, Oliver, maybe you could follow up on that. As, as you look at the at the cities and the increasing urbanization that's taking place, uh, all over the world, but certainly here in the province of Ontario, do we assume that every time a, a farmer's field gets taken over by a developer and a condo goes up, that's not good for the bugs? I mean, broadly speaking, yes, but I mean, there are accommodations you can make. I mean, there are some um, farming practices uh, being adopted in uh, the European Union and North Africa, for example, where you have these kind of wildlife corridors going through fields where there are kind of um, fringing plants, wildflowers that allow bugs to kind of cling on, survive in the margins. But yeah, generally speaking, the, the model of development in Canada and the US has one, been one of monocultural farming, uh, where you raise <laughs> meadows rich with insects and other life and make them into single crops, so soy or corn or, or wherever that may be, uh, with, with little kind of fringing plants that, uh, at the borders to, to support insect life. The same with um, urban development as well. We tend to want to get rid of messy weeds and, and, and plants we don't like in places we don't like them. Uh, and that's what insects need to kind of cling on. And so we're kind of creating a world that's quite kind of uniform and bland for insects. There's not much for them to eat, uh, not, not many kind of opportunities for them to move and breed and so on. So, yeah, our, our, our model of development is quite problematic when it comes to sustaining insect life. This is quite counterintuitive, actually, Antonio, isn't it? The stuff that we really think we need to get rid of is the stuff that, at the end of the day, is, is going to help us and that we need. Yes. we got a bit of a mindset that we got to change here, right? Well, it's a very human-centered mindset that we have, that development is good um, because we need housing and things like that. But you're taking homes away from other species, and we sort of need those other species. So... You know, there's only so many humans really that we can have on this planet before it's really catastrophic. Is that the right word? Okay, but let's talk <laughs> political reality. If if you want to get reelected, you got to have your eye on the prize. And at the moment, the prize is more housing, not more bugs. Fair to say? Yeah, but it's going to affect people. It's going to affect our air. It's going to affect our ecosystems. Everything's interconnected. And sure, you can have more housing for people, but all those insects and all those other life forms that share our space and share our environment, those need space too, because otherwise we're gonna suffer. Hmm. In the end, we will. Heather, are there other problematic aspects of this that say we haven't even considered or thought about yet? Well, I just wanted to add on that, like, of course, you know, development is our reality as, as our population grows, but there's ways of, you know, being smart in terms of the development. So in Ontario, the, right now, there's, you know, updated policy in terms of trying to move through a lot more housing. But there's been, you know, um, improvements recently about having developers add parkland and having, you know, other facilities and infrastructure in that are beneficial. And so, you know, when we move too fast and we're not being smart about it, then development you know, for sure is going to have a negative impact, but we could be smarter about the way we're doing it. So I just wanted to add that in. No, I appreciate that. But again, that requires some political will to insist on not just towers going up, but parkland that is associated with them. Do you see that kind of political spirit in the country or the province today? Um, less so. Like I said, I feel like we had in recent decades been making progress towards having developers, you know, as part of their agreement and contracts and having them contribute to building parkland in terms of um, improving lands around it and re reclamation. And so um, I realize right now there's huge pressure in terms of building fast. Um, we need housing, but, you know, we can't go backwards in terms of the way that we were, um, again, putting more pressure on the developers to then um, build up and build parklands around the, the housing developments. Well, Antonia, let's do a what if here. What if we don't get this right? What if we're not smart enough to understand that this is a major problem? I mean, Oliver's book is titled The Insect Crisis. If we're dealing with a crisis here and we don't take the right steps, what kind of consequences are we looking at? Well, that's the question, isn't it? That's why uh, I what's asked gonna, it. <laughs> what's going to happen? Um, I think it's going to happen somewhat incrementally. We're going to start losing insect species one by one 
And in many cases, we won't realize it until they're gone. Um, it's happened with bumblebees. There's a few species that are extinct, some extirpated in Ontario. Extirpated, meaning? Meaning they're no longer found in the province, but they're not totally extinct from other locations. So if that starts to happen, you're gonna have situations where the collapse of um, ecosystems happens, but it's going to happen very, very slowly and we won't really realize that it's happening. Let me pick up on that with Oliver. Are there challenges out there that even you experts don't really have a full handle on yet that, that we don't get? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we haven't even charted how many insect species there are out there in the world, for starters. I mean, there's about 1 million named species. There could be 5 million, 10 million. 20, 30 million. Um, no one's entirely sure. Uh, one scientist said to me, we've got, you know, 20,000 scientists studying one type of monkey and uh, t uh, um, what one scientist studying 20,000 types of insects. So there's a kind of big uh, a mismatch there in terms of resource. So we don't know what insects are doing around the world as yet uh, in every place in the world. We've got some pretty um, terrible glimpses in certain countries, but um, uh, we don't know what's going on in the tropics as as, as much as we do in North America and um, uh, and Europe. So there is there is some gaps in our knowledge, but we're already seeing some evidence that um, crop yields for certain um, uh, certain foods are declining, are being limited because of the lack of pollination. Pollination is one of the huge things, obviously, insects provide to us. Uh, there's a, there was a study showing um, uh, yields of uh, things like cherries and blueberries are declining in British Columbia and, and the US um, due to uh, uh, kind of constraints around pollination. So that, I think that's one of the big worries going forward this century. The United Nations has, has kind of warned there's going to be a, some sort of kind of food security issue uh, if these trends keep going forward where you have a kind of growing global population that needs more food that's pollinated at a time when pollination is becoming more stretched and harder to um, harder to get into the field. So I think that's one we've really got to keep an eye on is this issue of food security and, and nutrition because um, insects provide us all with all the great stuff on our plates, the colorful stuff, the nutritious stuff, the fruits and veg that um, we need to, um, to be healthy. So um, I think that's certainly one that uh, governments are going to have to eventually get to grips with. Do you sign out of that as well, Antonia? Yeah, if you think about it, I mean, just recently we had Halloween. All mm -hmm. those pumpkins are pollinated by bees, L little bees, solitary bees. And um, if those bees aren't there to pollinate the pumpkins, we're not going to have pumpkins anymore. Uh, there's no other species that could come in and do that job. Well, you could hand pollinate, but that's a big field to hand pollinate hmm. pumpkins, um, and it's not very efficient. Better to have the bees do it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Heather, again, I want to return to the monarchs for you. Uh, besides the fact that we would no longer have the spectacular beauty of looking at monarchs do their thing if they were to disappear, what are the other consequences of that? Well, I mean, again, in terms of its migratory pathway, I mean, it's just been so interesting from a scientific point of view, right? We study the monarch in terms of, you know, how it migrates, how can it figure out how to migrate so far? I mean, also monarch in its as a butterfly stage or the adult stage, it is a... It is a pollinator, it isn't a super efficient pollinator, but largely we use it to sort of capture other pollinators and the types of habitats that we're using to protect the monarch. So it sort of has this umbrella effect of, if we're looking at how to best protect the monarch, we're gonna also protect other pollinators that also need our help at the same time. So what it's sort of a win-win. What part of the world do most monarchs live in? Uh, their biggest breeding range or biggest population, I would say, is in the US. Um, it, um, their northern range, like they just tip into Ontario and around Ottawa is probably the northern range um, part. And so the U.S. is the, the biggest contributor to their population. And you're in Ottawa right now. Are you noticing a significant difference from years past? Um, it like it really depends on the year, I have to say. So the, the really tricky thing with insect populations, which we haven't had a chance to talk about yet, is that they actually fluctuate a lot year to year. So that's why, you know, having historical data and stuff is really important because we need to figure out what's this longer term trend versus how do insect populations generally fluctuate? So I will say that yes, the monarch populations have been fluctuating a lot around Ottawa. Um, in some years, yes, we definitely see uh, lower numbers. And okay, the, the populations that we have today, one last one, uh, Heather, for you. The populations that we see nowadays, how do they compare to either the worst years that you've studied or the best years that you've studied? 
For the monarch specifically, you mean? Yeah. <clears throat> well, so there's reports that, you know, the decline in the last 10 or so years is 20 to 70 percent lower numbers in monarch butterflies. And if you look back even further to the late 80s, it's like 80 percent. So uh, quite a big decline over that time period. The problem is year to year, again, there's a lot of fluctuating numbers up and down. And so um, right this year, we had a pretty good year. So it's hard for me to say, looking back that many years, you know, how it compares directly. But overall, there's a huge decline in the monarch population over that time period. All right. Let's ask the question that I'm sure everybody who's watching or listening to this is asking now, and that is, what are we going to do about this? And to that end, we're going back to Oliver's book for a quote. Here we go. An enduring rehabilitation will require us to do things that will have no concrete measure of success other than avoiding consequences that are objectively bad. Just to maintain what appears to be the status quo will take a sustained effort involving lots of large and incremental changes, many of them out of sight to most people, to the way we develop land, produce food, and generate energy. But before all that, we need to show on a fundamental level that we care. Okay, let's pick up there. Oliver, do we care? <laughs> Not enough. No, we don't. I think uh, more and more people are kind of getting their heads around the idea that there's that we should save the bees. I mean, I think that's a kind of catch call that some people have kind of flocked to now. And we're seeing some efforts uh, at a kind of local level to support monarch populations and, and other things. But on a broad level, we don't. I think that was one of the most interesting things in writing this book was to look at that kind of cultural question of what we value and what's important to us and, and how there's a huge discrepancy between those things. I mean, we spend so much time and effort and money on conserv the conservation of the kind of big beasts of our world, you know, the, the rhinos and the elephants and the uh, so, Sumatran tiger and orangutan and so on. I mean, these are wonderful creatures and it would be a horrible crime if we were to let them go extinct. But in terms of the impact on our lives from a selfish point of view, um, the loss of these creatures would be minimal. Uh, whereas the loss of insects by one kind of estimate uh, would uh, would cause us to die out as a as a species within a few months. I mean, they're absolutely fundamental to our our food production, to our waste disposal, to the health of our ecosystems. I mean, insects are uh, hugely important to us, and yet we treat them with disdain, or we consider them to be pointless a lot of the time. So we need to show we care. We need to show that they are important to us, that we value them and that uh, we need them around. It's not just the question of swatting away flies. It's, it's supporting creatures that provide you with chocolate <laughs> and, uh, and um, you know, cranberries and, um, you know, all the melons and all these other kind of things that you, you like to eat. So, um, yeah, I think we do need to show we care. We need some really big changes and we need some kind of small incremental day-to-day -day changes too. I think it is possible we can do it because insects are the great survivors. They predated the dinosaurs. They they outlived the dinosaurs. They show they can get through tough times. Um, we just need to give them a helping hand to do so. Okay, well, let me do one quick follow-up from that list that you had in that quote there, and that is generate energy. What do we have to stop doing? What do we need to start doing? Well, we need to stop burning fossil fuels. I mean, that's, that's the kind of number one thing we need to do as a planet, probably, uh, beyond anything else that's going on in the world at the moment. Um, we're seeing kind of our addiction to fossil fuels is causing huge problems as we're seeing flowing from the war in Ukraine and the kind of gas prices and what's happened there. Um, but more broadly, it's causing the heating of the planet that's, um, you know, destroying ecosystems, driving extinctions, uh, causing heat waves and flooding and so on to, to humans. Um, so we need to stop burning fossil fuels. Uh, we need to transition to uh, cleaner energy. Um, and that will help um, that will help insects and it will help very much help ourselves. Antonia, what's on your list of things we got to stop doing and things we got to start doing? Well, there are certain, there are lots of things that we can actually do as individuals. I mean, if you have a garden or even a balcony, plant native plants. Uh, that's one of the not simple things, but that's one of the things that you know you can do as individual person. Don't use pesticides because that's, of course, killing insects. Um, Go for a walk, be curious, learn about the insects around you. Um, contribute to conservation efforts. Uh, the Nature Conservancy of Canada, for example, is um, preserving habitats. Those are very important. Um, also, take pictures of insects. Contribute to the information for scientists to use. Use 
there's an app called iNaturalist that's wonderful. Um, it will help you to identify those insects or even other species. That sounds um, like a good list. It, it is. Visit museums, you know, <laughs> support your natural history research. Says the lady um, who works at the Royal Ontario Museum. Course. There you go. <laughs> Makes sense to me. Um, but I agree with Oliver. Everything that we can do to stop or slow down climate change is important, um, as well as, you know, um, reducing that impact that we have on um, land use. Mm. So um, stop trying to take over all of the meadows and all of the forests. Okay, good list. Heather, why don't you get the last word here? What's on your list of stop doing this and start doing this? Well, I think like start to pay attention to all the areas that insects can use as habitat. So again, as we mentioned, so like planting native plants, but also thinking about the amount of salt that we're putting onto our roadways in the winter, which is coming up. And so the salt feeds into the waterways and is killing aquatic um, insects. Thinking about the type of lighting that we're using in urban environments, because that's having a huge impact, all the lighting we have on insects in terms of their behavior, in terms of their mating. So that's hugely important. I will say that um, voting is a huge issue or a huge way that you can um, have a say and think about who best represents your interests and think about who is thinking about environmental issues, who's thinking about what can do what we can do for insects. And so, you know, we had a really low voter turnout last week in our municipal elections in Ontario. So make sure you get out and vote and do your research on the candidates. That has a huge impact. Again, think about the new legislation that's coming in for housing and how that's going to impact all the insect habitats. Um, and then put pressure on our federal government to have higher or more stringent policy in terms of protecting species at risk. So there's a lot of things that we can do as individuals, both in terms of how we vote and in terms of how we manage the, the urban environments that we're living in right now. Those are some good to-do lists that you have sent us away to do our homework with. So my thanks to all three of you for joining us on TVO tonight. Antonia Guidotti from the Royal Ontario Museum, Heather Caruba from the University of Ottawa, Oliver Millman, more on this in his book, The Insect Crisis, The Fall of the Tiny Empires That Run the World. Thanks so much, you three. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.